ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be talking about gases, which is chapter 5 in Zumdahl, the 7th edition. Um, so again, follow along with your notes, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, first things first, let's talk about what gases are. So these are gas molecules that are bouncing around on the inside of a container. Gases are going to uniformly fill any container that you put them in. Uh, they are going to be very easily compressible, meaning that they can be squished. Um, they will mix completely with any other gas. So you can see that we've got a little red and little um, blue circles representing different types of gas molecules here. And notice that they are just totally mixing with um, each other. There's not like a separating factor there or anything. They exert pressure on its surroundings. We'll talk about what pressure is in a second. And um, here is technically what causes pressure. So pressure is defined as force over area. And what's applying that force are going to be those gas molecules that were bouncing around in the previous animation. So the official SI unit of pressure is Newton uh, divided by meter squared because it's force. So the um, SI unit of force is Newtons. And then area is in you know meters squared since meters would be... Um, uh, our measurement of length, right? And so that's equal to one Pascal, or and so Pascal is abbreviated as PA, but there are a bunch, and I mean a bunch of different units for pressure. In fact, even though Pascal's is kind of like um, uh, the SI unit officially, it's not the one that you will see most frequently, especially even in a lot of gas law problems. So what we tend to use in the United States uh, is called the atmosphere. And so an atmosphere is exactly what it sounds like. It is the force of the atmosphere at sea level pushing down on you because all the gas molecules are pushing down at you all the time, every time you stand up or lie down. And so that is basically what a standard atmosphere is. Now, a standard atmosphere is equal to 101,325 pascals. So there's a, a Quite a big difference between the SI unit of what a Pascal is and then what we experience every single day on Earth at uh, sea level. Now, a standard atmosphere is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. And so in case you're wondering what that's a reference to, that's a reference to a barometer um, with mercury in it. And uh, that's why it's measured in millimeters of, and then yeah, that's the symbol for mercury. Um, this is a little J-tube. Uh, you can see that, um, well, actually, you know what? I think that's probably even on the next slide. So here's how a barometer works. So you have a tube that has a, a vacuum, um, a vacuum sealed, let's say, tube on this end. And then you have this little tray of mercury. And so what's happening here is the atmosphere is pushing down on the mercury. And what it's doing is it's going to be uh, causing this little this little uh, tube um, here of mercury to either grow or shrink depending on what the pressure is outside, depending on the force of of, of this uh, downward push by the atmosphere. So when we said 760 millimeters of mercury, what we meant is that if you measured the distance from here to where that little uh, vial of mercury stops, this little um, meniscus here, that would be 760 millimeters if we were to measure it at um, sea level. And so that's technically how barometers really work. Um, and like it says, it's just a device to measure atmospheric pressure. And here's kind of what I just described to you. Mercury flows out of the tube until the pressure of the column of mercury standing on the surface of the mercury in the dish is equal to the pressure of the air on the rest of the surface of the mercury dish. So in other words, this is moving depending on the force at which uh, the mercury is being pushed down by the atmosphere itself. Because again, this is sealed and this is open to the atmosphere to be able to basically take that pressure um, and to be able to uh, exert, like it says, um, a force as a result. So this isn't really in the book, but manometer, what is a manometer? It's a device that's used for measuring the pressure of gas in a container. If you've ever checked your own tire pressure, um, you have digital ones now, but one of the most simple ones is you basically hook this up to your tire and it will 
um, basically shoot out a little tiny measuring device that will tell you what the pressure is inside of your tire. Um, you can also get little gas pressure valves that you can see where um, it'll just give you a readout, which we're going to see a lot in a second. Okay. Um, here is the beauty though of looking at pressure and looking at the gas laws. Um, there are tons of different phenomena like this can crushing um, demonstration that you often see that can be explained using gases and specifically in this case pressure. So we've got ourselves a little uh, Pepsi can that has water in it. They're heating it up so that it starts to boil. You can't really see, but there's steam coming out. Then when you collapse it into ice cold water, you get this crushing effect. And so the question is, what's causing that crushing effect? Well, here is what's happening. Okay. We have the gas inside of the container which normally it is just equal. You have gas molecules inside, you have gas molecules on the outside, and they are in equal number because gas is able to escape or able to just kind of, you know, um, leave whenever. Um, now, what you're doing when you're, um, when you're boiling water in here is you're forcing a lot of these molecules in here outside. And so now the pressure isn't going to be exactly the same because you are forcing these molecules out um, as a result of boiling this water. And so afterwards, what you have is you have a deficit of fewer molecules inside, and that's gas molecules, and more molecules on the outside. And when that happens, the pressure of the atmosphere, so just the atmospheric pressure, just the pressure that's in that room, is able to crush the can. And you might think, how did the temperature kind of facilitate that? Well, again, boiling water is going to cause a lot of these gas molecules to escape. And then by cooling it off, what you're doing is you're basically coalescing now whatever gas is in here is going to immediately get extremely cold now. Um, as a result of the fact that now it has basically been shocked. And so um, in the process of doing that, the gas molecules that would normally be bouncing around like crazy on the inside of the container, keeping the pressure equal, are now no longer able to keep that pressure equal. And so now we have a deficit. And so again, here's a before picture and an after picture of how that collapsing can actually functions. So another thing, because there are so many units of pressure, it becomes important to be able to convert between different units of pressure. And so here's a question. The pressure of a gas is measured to be 2.5 atmospheres. Can we convert this to Tor and to Pascals? Answer, yes, we can. All of those numbers you saw on the previous couple of slides um, are giving us the relationship between atmospheres and Tor, or between atmospheres and Pascals, or between, you know, whatever units you want to choose. So all we have to do is do a conversion factor, like we've done already in the first couple of units of study. So as long as your units are canceling, so notice atmospheres are disappearing, I have Tor on top, so I do 2.5 times 760, and that gives me this result. I could do the same thing again with Pascals, since we know that Pascals is a lot bigger of a number. We expect a bigger answer. Notice that my units are canceling here. I do 2.5 times 101,325, um, and I get, again, this result. And so, again, being able to convert between units of pressure, pretty easy. Now let's do another kind of weird example, but this is for the next section. So liquid nitrogen in a balloon. This is liquid nitrogen. It's extremely cold, obviously, and we're putting a blown up balloon inside and this is what's occurring. So think about like, again, pressure and what's occurring in this situation. Hopefully you thought of something like this. So when it is in its, let's say, um, fully inflated form, the molecules are just bouncing around on the inside and you could probably guess, the gas molecules on the outside are also bouncing around. They're not in the picture though, okay? Now what happens when you cool it off are that these molecules are starting to move a lot slower. And as they move slower, they're not really generating as much pressure anymore. Because remember, it's force over area. And so if I'm changing the force on the inside, now that means that the molecules on the outside that are just in the air, they haven't slowed down at all. They're still moving around at the exact same rate. So that means that this is going to start to shrink as these are now barely hitting the inside of the balloon, whereas the air molecules that are on the outside are now really pushing on this or seem to be pushing on it a lot more, even though they're pushing on it just the same amount as they were before. 
it's again an illusion almost of um, atmospheric pressure. All right, so uh, the wonderful thing about gas laws are that there are plenty of ways of discovering the gas laws without actually having to just memorize a bunch of equations. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I have a bunch of gas that I put inside of this container. Um, and take a look at the pressure and take a look at the temperature here. What do you think is going to happen if I add more gas to this container? Make a hypothesis. So I'm going to add some more. And notice what happens. The pressure increases. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does, right? It's force over area. And now I'm basically adding more molecules that are going to be creating more collisions, which is, you know, more force. Okay. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I expand this container and make it bigger? Let's make it bigger. Notice the pressure goes down. Now there's more space for the molecules to bounce around. What if I shrink it? Pressure goes up. Again, now there's less area for this stuff to hit around it. I haven't lowered the amount of um, gas, and so again, kind of makes sense, right, intuitively. Now, what if, what if I change the temperature? So picture this, right? What if I increase the heat? What do you think is going to happen? Look what's happening in the pressure, and obviously I'm increasing the temperature, so you can see the, um, the increase in the thermometer here. So pressure goes up. What if I cool it off? What if I instead am taking energy and absorbing it? pressure goes down. Again, all of these things are easily discoverable. Um, what if I remove some of the gas? Take some of the gas out. Look, the pressure is going down. So again, these are all gas laws technically. All right, so let's talk about the gas laws. Gas laws can be deduced from observations. So we could have um, used that simulation that you just saw. We could have used a can crushing demonstration. We could have used a balloon in liquid nitrogen. But the mathematical relationships are kind of the important ones that we think of when we think of gas laws. So laws don't explain why things happen, okay? They just explain, in fact, they don't explain why at all. Instead, they kind of show you the relationship between the variables, between pressure, volume, temperature, moles, etc. So let's talk about Boyle's Law. What is Boyle's Law? Boyle's Law is that pressure and volume are inversely related. And that is true at a constant temperature and if we have the same number of moles of gas. So the way that that kind of functions is that it's equal to a constant, which is, like it says here, um, specific to the sample of air that you're looking at a particular temperature. So PV equals K. But the easiest kind of way of looking at Boyle's Law is that if you have the pressure of a gas and you have the volume of a gas, and now you are changing the pressure or volume, but keeping the temperature the same and not changing the number of moles of gas in your container, this is the relationship between those variables. The pressure of your start, let's say your starting pressure times your starting volume is going to be equal to your final pressure times your final volume. That's what Boyle's Law is really about. And so when you graph it, you kind of get this shape, which of course is an inverse uh, graphical shape. It makes sense. And so what that's telling you is that if the pressure is increasing, the volume must be going down. And think about that, right? So as you add more mass, let's say, to the top of this, and so as we are pushing down with more pressure, the volume is going to be shrinking, and there's going to be less room for those gas molecules to be able to move around. And notice the temperature is the same, and we're not changing the amount of gas. So here's an example. A sample of helium gas occupies 12.4 liters at 23 degrees Celsius and 0.956 atmospheres. What volume will it occupy at 1.20 atmospheres, assuming that the temperature stays constant? So the first thing that you should do is that um, when you're reading this is obviously look at what it's asking for and look at all of your variables. Also, keep in mind that if something is constant, that means that it is not necessary in the problem. So the fact that it's 23 degrees Celsius actually isn't going to be used at all because the temperature is not changing. So all I really need, according to Boyle's Law, is I need to have my starting pressure, my starting volume, and then, again, something else. So in this case, I have my final pressure, but I'm missing my final volume. So all I would need to do is just plug that in. And so the setup is this is my P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Notice that atmospheres are going away. They are the same. And so I'm left with just liters as my unit. And that would be my unit then for my volume.
So just do this, right? We got 0.956 times 12.4, and to get this by itself, we're dividing by 1.2, and you get 9.88 liters. Again, simple, and then always ask yourself, does that make sense? I'm increasing the pressure. I'm going from 0.956 to 1.2. What should happen to the volume if I'm increasing the pressure? The volume should go down, and it did. It went from 12.4 to 9.88. Charles law. So Charles law is volume and temperature. And so when we're talking about temperature, we're talking about the temperature in Kelvin, not in Celsius. And what that's saying in Charles law is that they are directly related. And that's only true at constant pressure and at constant number of moles of gas. So what that means is that volume is equal to this proportionality constant, which we'll just call B, um, times temperature, times T. Now keep in mind that it, Kelvin is um, at the official SI unit of temperature, and it's the one that you really don't get to see very often, right? We've been using Celsius most of the time. So why is that the case? Um, well, Celsius is more practical, but Kelvin is the official SI unit, and it will make way more sense later on why we use this, but I'll just kind of tell you now, in order to get from uh, Celsius to Kelvin, all you do is you take your Celsius number and you add 273 to it, and that gives you Kelvin. So zero Kelvin is called absolute zero. And this is the reason why we use temperature in Kelvin, because there is no temperature lower than zero K. You can't get colder than zero K. And you might think, okay, what, why is that useful? Well, think about this. That means that if you're doing volume and temperature work, you never want to multiply or divide by zero because that's going to give you no result or it's going to give you one of those weird overflows in your calculator that says, oh, can't divide by zero. It's impossible. So the other kind of little caveat to that is that um, Celsius also has negative values, right? So, and we know we can't have a negative volume. We can't have like a negative pressure in standard problems like this. So Kelvin is way more useful because there are no negative values and zero is the lowest number and it's impossible to get that cold. So here's Charles' law, V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. And notice again, that if we were to use something other than this, it's possible we divide by zero and get no result. Or even worse, we divide by a negative value if it was in Celsius and we get something like negative volume, which doesn't make any sense. So just for completeness sake, remember, we always need to convert to Kelvin by adding 273 to our Celsius numbers um, whenever we do any gas law problems. So when we say it's a direct uh, relationship, what we're talking about is if you graph volume and temperature, we get this nice straight line. And that makes sense, right? So again, if we have this volume of gas and I'm heating it up, I would expect it to expand and get bigger. Now suppose I have a balloon, 1.30 liters of air at 24.7 degrees Celsius, and I'm placing it into a beaker with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen, let's say, is at negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. What will be the volume of the sample of air um, at constant pressure? Again, constant pressure, that means I can ignore it. Let's figure that out. So I have my starting volume here. I have my starting temperature, but it's in Celsius. So I need to add 273 to get it to Kelvin. And then again, I have my volume here, okay? Again, uh, unknown in this situation. And I'm dividing by, instead, my liquid nitrogen temperature. Again, I can't have a negative temperature. That would give me some sort of weird negative volume and stuff again, right? So I would need to take my 273 and subtract 78.5, which is that number right here. And now all I do is I plug it into my calculator, all right? So we can solve this pretty easily and get that our Kelvin is going to disappear and I'm left with just liters in my answer and that's 0.849 liters. Again, does that answer make sense? I have warm, basically, let's say warm air in this balloon. And so what would I expect if I'm cooling it down to a ridiculously cold degree? I would expect it to shrink and it does. It goes from 1.3 liters to 0.849 liters. Avogadro's law. So volume and the number of moles are directly related. And again, we have to have constants. So that's only true at constant temperature and constant pressure. So again, using our nice, nice little symbols here, the volume of a gas is equal to some proportionality constant times the number of moles. And so we like to write that like this. So the number of moles 
divided by the volume of the gas is equal to a different number of moles divided by the new volume of the gas. So this would be like adding gas or taking away gas from a balloon. So here we go. We have um, 97.87 grams of argon gas, and it's occupying a volume of 89 liters. What volume will 2.10 moles occupy under the same conditions of temperature and pressure? So again, temperature and pressure aren't important. They're constant. And notice, though, that I have different units. I have grams here, and I have moles here. These have to be the same unit, just like when we're doing volume work, you have to have the same unit of volume, or when we're doing temperature work, we have to have the same uh, unit of temperature. It has to be in Kelvin. So this has to be in moles. And so this is just a nice little reminder of how we go from grams to moles. So 97.87 grams, I look up what argon's uh, molar mass is from the periodic table. It's equal to 39.948 grams per mole. So notice that grams go away. I'm left with moles, and I get 2.450 moles from that. Now that I have the same unit, I can plug it into Avogadro's law. So 2.450 moles divided by this volume, 89.0, is going to be equal to 2.10 moles of argon under, again, a different, uh, a different volume. So I'm trying to find this volume. So notice that the volume is going down. So when I plug this into my calculator and I do my division here, right, um, what would I expect? Well, I would expect the liters to be lower because there's less gas. The less gas there is inside of the container, the less volume it should take up. So that's 76.3 liters. So a visualization of this, which by the way, I just realized, I'm not sure how good quality this is, but uh, we just saw Boyle's Law, we saw Charles' Law, and we saw Avogadro's Law. There's also a relationship between temperature and pressure. It's called Gay-Lussac's Law. And that just says that as you increase the temperature of something, that the pressure is going to be increasing as a result of that. All right, so can we bring these all together? Yes, we can. Um, so the ideal gas law is what section 5.3 is about. We can bring together every single one of these. Volume is equal to this, volume is equal to this, volume is equal to this. And what do we get? We get the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles, and T is the temperature. So you're probably thinking, where did the R come from? Well, R is a constant. And so that's what we get when we look at all these things, B, A, K, whatever kind of symbol we're using to represent these constants. When you take them all into account, you actually get a universal gas constant. So R is always going to be equal to 0 0.08206. And then these are the units of the constant. So it looks ridiculous, but it's liters times atmospheres per mole degree Kelvin here. Okay. So notice this is for the volume part. This is for the pressure part. This is for the mole part. And then this is for the temperature part. So it's kind of like, because it's a constant, it's kind of like keeping track of all of the units. And it's going to make your math a lot easier when you're trying to keep track of your units. Now, how are you going to remember PV equals NRT? My professor told me when I was in Gen Chem 1 um, to basically remember it like this. Don't be a perv nerd. PV equals NRT. And so that's how I always have remembered it. Don't be a perv nerd. All right. So automobile tire. Let's say we have a tire. It's at 23 degrees Celsius with an internal volume of 25.0 liters when it's filled up with air. The pressure inside is 3.18 atmospheres. How many moles of air are there inside of this tire? Again, don't be a pervenant, PV equals NRT. So this is my pressure. This is my volume. N is unknown, because that's what I'm looking for. This is my ideal gas constant or universal gas constant. And then remember, I can't have this in Celsius, so I have to add 273 to get Kelvin. Notice all these units, atmospheres go away. The liters go away. Kelvin goes away. That's the beauty of the universal gas constant. You're always going to be left with the unit that you actually want in your problem. So what does that end up being when we solve it out? 3.27 moles. All right, what is the pressure in a 304.0 liter tank that contains 5.670 kilograms of helium at 25 degrees Celsius? All right, let's think about this. Well, first of all, this is a weird unit, kilograms. So I got to get that into a unit I can use. And so thankfully, I can go from kilograms to grams and then from grams to moles. So in case you forgot, okay, there are a thousand grams in a kilogram, right? So kilograms are going to go away. I'm left with grams. 
Perfect. Now, how many grams per mole are there um, in helium? Well, on your periodic table, it says that there are 4.00 grams per mole for helium. So I do 5,670 grams divided by 4.00 grams per mole. Grams go away, and I'm left with a huge quantity of moles, 1,418 moles. Now I can plug that into PV equals NRT. Don't be a perv nerd. P, again, I don't know. V, I know that. That's 304.0 liters. Moles, I just found that. So I have my N for moles. I have my constant. And then again, remember, I have to always have my temperature in Kelvin. So that means that I have to add 273 to 25. So liters go away. Moles go away. Kelvin goes away, and I'm left with the magic one I want, atmospheres. When I find that, I get 114 atmospheres or so, and that would be the correct answer to that. Now, there is a combined gas law. P1 times V1 over T1 equals P2 times V2 over T2. So that would be, again, um, ignoring moles. And so if you ever have a problem that doesn't mention moles or says that the amount of gas is constant, that would mean that you can use something like this to solve that problem. Now, how are you going to remember that? The way I've always remembered it is please vomit over the toilet. P, V over T. Please vomit over the toilet. All right, so at what temperature in degrees Celsius does 121 milliliters of CO2 at 27 degrees Celsius and 1.05 atmospheres occupy a volume of 293 milliliters at a pressure of 1.40 atmospheres. All right, lots and lots of numbers. And you might think, oh, great, you know, I see milliliters here. I'm probably going to have to convert that to liters because so far all of my problems have said liters. Well, here's the beauty again of units. If you have something that is in milliliters and the other side of the equation also has milliliters, as long as they're in the same unit, it doesn't actually matter because we can erase those milliliters, right? Those milliliters are basically just going to cancel out. Now, again, that's just something that you kind of realize as you go through these problems. But PV over T, so I have 100, I'm sorry, 1.05 atmospheres to start. I have 121 milliliters. And again, I have 27 degrees Celsius. Yes, I have to still convert that to Kelvin. Don't think, oh, okay, look. Celsius is going to just disappear and everything. No, you're going to want to make sure that no matter what, you always convert to Kelvin, and then you just convert to Celsius at the end if you have to convert back to something. So um, still, I'm going to add my 273 to this in order to get my final temperature in Kelvin. Um, now, what's the opposite side of the equation? Well, I have 1.40 atmospheres. I have 293 milliliters. Notice the milliliters go away atmospheres go away, I'm left with Kelvin. And so my answer is going to be this, 423K. Notice though, the question asks me what temperature in degrees Celsius. That means that I'm going to have to add 273 to that in order to get my 696 degrees Celsius. All right. So any questions about that, um, just think through uh, again, kind of all of the examples we've done so far. And hopefully, again, that'll, that'll kind of give you more of like a, a, a common way of looking at these kinds of more complicated problems. So section 5.4, this is the last section we're going to get to, by the way. So gas stoichiometry. So molar volume of an ideal gas. Um, something kind of interesting. So if you have one mole of an ideal gas, and that is at zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, the volume of the gas is always going to be equal to 22.42 liters. You might think, okay, why? Right? That's something that I would always ask. The nice thing is the ideal gas law gives us the answer. So if we plug in these numbers into the ideal gas law, so one mole, we plug in our constant, we plug in our value at zero degrees Celsius is equal to 273, remember, K, um, and we plug in our, you know, our one atmosphere, we get 22.42 liters. So that was not just magic. That did not just occur. The units canceled and we ended up with this volume. And so the thing about that is um, it's a very useful quantity to use when we're doing stoichiometry. 
And this is where we get into something called standard temperature and standard pressure. So standard temperature and pressure is defined as zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. And so anytime you see STP in a problem, it's trying to point out to you that you know then what the volume, sorry, you know what the um, pressure is and you know what the temperature is without them having to spell it out for you because standard temperature and pressure is defined as zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. And so keep in mind that if you see STP um, and we're talking about an ideal gas, that means that the volume of that gas, if we're talking about one mole of it, is going to be 22.42 liters or some, uh, some fraction thereof. Okay, so if like you have two moles, you can imagine that you would double this amount. If you had half a mole, you would have that amount. So here's a good example, though. Uh, I have a sample of oxygen gas. It has a volume of 2.50 liters at STP, so standard temperature and pressure. How many grams of oxygen are present? It doesn't look like you'd have enough information to solve this problem. You only see one number. But in reality, if I know that I have, again, PV equals NRT, so again, don't be a perv nerd, I actually have temperature and pressure already here. And so what it's really asking me to look for is moles, and for moles, I can get grams. So PV equals NRT. All right. So at standard temperature and standard pressure, I've got one atmosphere, and I've got 273K. I have my constant already. I have 2.50 liters. So all I'm really missing here is the number of moles. So notice all of these units are canceling and I'm left with moles. I get 0.112 moles of oxygen. It's asking for grams though. So remember, one oxygen atom is 16 grams per mole. If I have two, I would multiply by 32.00 grams per mole to get 3.57 grams of oxygen. Another interesting little thing is that you can find the molar mass of a gas. And so there's a whole other equation, but molar mass is equal to the density of the gas measured in grams over liters times R, again, same R as before, temperature in Kelvin divided by the pressure. And so if we actually put these units in, the reason why that works is because look at all these units, they start canceling away. And so what I'm left with when I start canceling all these units, and so again, grams and moles and stuff, um, what I start to find out is that, oh, the molar mass is equal to the density times the gas constant times temperature divided by P. So if you rearrange this, this is how I learned it though. I learned it as the pressure times the molar mass is equal to the density times the universal gas constant times temperature. So the way I always remembered it is this. The prime minister is dirt. So pressure times molar mass is equal to density times the ideal gas constant or universal gas constant times temperature. And so here is an interesting application of that. What is the density of fluorine gas at STP? And yes, it wants it in grams per liter. There are plenty of other units of density, but whenever you do uh, the prime minister is dirt <laughs> as your equation, it always asks for density or gives you density in grams per liter. So let's do that. Let's rearrange our you know, um, equation. So if I rearrange and solve for density, I get molar mass times pressure is equal to, or sorry, the molar mass times pressure divided by the ideal gas constant or universal gas constant times the temperature is equal to the density. Great. What is the molar mass of fluorine? It is 19, but I have, again, it's a diatomic gas, so I have double that. Um, again, multiplying by one atmosphere, nice and easy. I have my um, ideal gas or universal gas constant, and I have my standard temperature and pressure stuff, right? So this is my standard temperature. That's my standard pressure. What do I get? My units are canceling. I get a density of 1.70 grams per liter. All right. And so that takes us through kind of the center of our chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, make sure you subscribe since I'll be going through the next part um, and all the rest of the chapters in that book. Mm -hmm.